I'm Amy Sola, the Executive Director for Little River Wetlands. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Allie. Thank you very much. Cool. Hey guys, how are you? Warm weather, feels nice, right? Beautiful. A little teaser before tomorrow. <laughs> but I want to tell you about, uh, if you, none of you don't know, I'm Allie Munger. I'm the wetland educator here. Been here a month. Feels pretty good, right? Getting my, getting my uh, bearings. And today, we've got Chris Rex here. Um, he has a Bachelor of Science degree in Zoology, Ecology, and Biochemistry from Ball State University and a Master of Science degree in Biology from the University of Northern Colorado. He's got 22 years of experience working with snakes, right? <laughs> uh, he currently is the Vice President of a local secular humanist group, Free Thought Fort Wayne, serves on the Sci-Fi Committee at Science Central, Tutors students in math and science. I don't know what's harder dealing with stakes or tutoring students in math. <laughs> <laughs> um, and works as assistant lecturer of biology at Ball State University and an adjunct biology professor at Ivy Tech Community College. We are so happy to have him here with us to share with us today about how we can identify venomous snakes in our area and uh, kind of gain an understanding as to why they're important to have here. So. Without further ado, are you ready? Yeah, cool. Yeah. All right, well, let's break out. Okay, so uh, before I get too far along uh, into my snake talk, because snakes are definitely the number one thing that I want to talk to you about uh, as much as humanly possible. <coughs> Um, I just want to take a moment to appreciate this beautiful animal, uh, which we actually found near to this location, uh, one of the hiking spots near here. Uh, I just wanted to kind of ask the question, before we get too far into this and I start becoming a, a lecturer in the classroom, um, what kind of species of snake are we looking at here? Right, this is a plain old garter snake. And it's just incredible some of the detail that you can see when you're bold enough to put your camera an inch away and take a picture of it. So this is a, a level of detail where you don't normally get to, to appreciate the animal quite from that perspective. Uh, but that's really kind of my goal today, is to kind of give you a more in-depth view of these animals so you can better appreciate them and maybe learn a little bit more about them uh, to kind of encourage you to some deal of respect um, when dealing with these animals or thinking about these creatures. So that's definitely what I want to do in this presentation. However, I have to divert just for a sec because you have to appreciate how today is a special event. Wow. And if we recall, a year ago, unfortunately there was a, another event that coincided with this day, uh, where we had the legendary professor Stephen Hawking uh, perish on this day. So just to kind of memorialize him and take a moment to appreciate Pi Day, really kind of want to just focus on some of his accomplishments, and one of the most important things that I think that he contributed to science was not only the fact that he was able to communicate these great in-depth topics, they're incredibly hard to comprehend, like quantum physics, to the general public by publishing some of these wonderful books that are bestsellers. But he also was key and instrumental in taking what we knew about black holes at the time and how we can take basically all the stuff in the universe and compress it down into a single point called singularity, creating that black hole appearance. Well, we had mathematical equations to describe that. What we did not have at the time that Hawking was going through school was a way to relate this to the Big Bang. But he was able to do that. He was able to show the Big Bang is literally just taking all those equations for the black hole and reversing them. How can we have everything go down into nothing? And how we can have everything come out of nothing, so to speak. And he was able to do that, which was a critical mathematical uh, point in time, so to speak. But anyway, aside from that, what we also like to do on the day a day like today, is celebrate science in general. And think about how we're able to communicate these ideas to the public and try to educate people about things from a more factual perspective and an evidence-based perspective. Because especially now more than ever, undoubtedly in this country, we are facing a problem with determining what is fact and what is fiction. And no field of study right now is hit as hard as health and medicine. 
And so I'm just going to briefly run through some of these things and hit, we, hit you with a whole lot of things. Just because we're not here to talk about this, but we can at least appreciate some of what science has done for us. Right? So I'm going to say some things that you might not agree with. So that's fine. I'm going to go through it really fast. So here we go. First off, vaccines are fantastic and great. End of story. Not going beyond that. Then we can even talk about things in our foods. We can talk about how hormones, which we normally consider as being something bad in our foods, well, guess what? Hormones are in all of our foods. End of story. Get over it. <laughs> then we can move on to something like probiotics, which are becoming increasingly prevalent in some of the products that we buy. But once again, more often than not, these products aren't necessarily needed. Unless you've undergone extensive antibiotic therapy, or colonoscopy, or something that's going to eliminate your flora that's already present in your body, probiotics are useless. And will do nothing for you. I'm sorry. Moving on to the next topic. We have essential oils, which are really prevalent nowadays. You can have essential oil to cure this, that, and the other, whatever. All of that is nonsense. I'm sorry. A whole lot of money spent on nothing. <laughs> However, we have another contention here. With GMOs, genetically modified organisms. They are great, they are fantastic, they are doing wonderful things for us. And yet there's so much hate against GMOs. Once again, we're not here to talk about those. But just note, those are the facts. If we compare these guys to our organic foods, which are taking over the market at the moment, more often than not, what you'll notice is that organic foods are not as highly regulated as GMOs are. They're often less safe, and they're always more costly. So once again, I don't understand why we're going in that direction. It doesn't make any sense to me as a scientist. But the reasoning is this last point that I'm going to hit real hard before we move on, <coughs> which is that organics are typically perceived as being more natural. Right? If we think about what's natural, we normally consider this as being something that's better for us. <clears throat> but 100 years ago, just a little over 100 years ago, what was natural for humans on this planet was to have an average life expectancy at birth of 30 years. Just 100 years ago, for the entire planet. Now it's more than doubled since then. Because we are no longer doing things in a natural way. We have access to clean food, clean water, access to vaccines. We are enriching our foods to prevent malnutrition. And we are using artificial means to keep us alive when we are faced with imminent death. Just as, as a for instance, one year ago, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. I would not be here speaking to you today if it wasn't for artificial means like chemotherapy and radiation. I would be in the ground. What was natural was for me to die at the age of 33. Natural is not good. <laughs> not necessary. <laughs> right? So, just to hit you with some, uh, some quick things before we move on to what we're really here for, which is snakes. Right? And so along those lines, I kind of have this brief outline kind of going over how this talk is going to proceed. And the way that I want to start off is kind of discussing something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is some of the research that I did during my master's, where I was able to go in and look at snakes from a different perspective, and look at their venoms very specifically with regard to a number of different contexts. But in order to understand that, we have to first cover some material from a more classroom setting. And so I'm going to evaluate you. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> By asking you some questions about the next few slides. So what is this organism? Right. Fungus, a mushroom, whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were to classify this organism, would we classify it as being venomous, poisonous, both, or neither? Ah, so you might not live if you eat it, so if we're assuming that, 
We know it would probably be dangerous to some degree. So we'd probably call it what? Poisonous. 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 Right. How about these guys? Yes, delicious. <laughs> delicious, yes. <laughs> Awfully good when fried in a skillet and added with some seasoning, right? So these guys are neither. Okay. Even though they're the same type of critter, a mushroom, these are safe to eat critters. How about this guy? Hmm. Venomous. Venomous, okay. Why do you say that? Stinger. Yeah. This guy's stinger. Alright? Do you love them? I tricked you. But I did. So, this is actually an interesting example that we see in the animal kingdom of mimicry. This is actually a kind of fly. And we can tell by looking at the eyes, which are very large and red. As opposed to bees, which have black eyes. This guy is trying to appear venomous to you. So you leave them alone. Clever. Easy. <laughs> What's he called? What I'm not an entomologist. I do not know what he's called. <laughs> <laughs> he's called a jerk in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> trying to trick me. <laughs> Alright, so how about our honeybee? Mm -hmm. We said before he was venomous. Okay, so we understand that. Excellent. How about this guy? Hmm. The large critter in the middle of this. What do we call this guy? Dagger yeah. long legs. For sure. Okay. All right. Now, what is often kind of touted or said about this critter? It's poison. That's what? <laughs> that he can't bite you? Okay. But he's not venomous. He's not venomous. Stay safe. They regrow their legs. Okay. Dang, I'm not hearing what I want oh, to hear. Some people I've often heard, they're most venomous of all the spiders. <laughs> Thank you. So we sometimes hear this rumor that this is one of the most dangerous or venomous creatures, but he doesn't have the fangs necessary to penetrate your skin. That's what I was fishing for. <laughs> so with that, we would assume that this critter is also venomous. But, as some other people <laughs> said here in the front, he's harmless. But he's not harmless for the same reason that we just talked about. He's harmless because he actually has more in common with the tick than he does with the spider. He just looks to our eyes to be a spider. But he doesn't have fangs, and he doesn't have venom. So we finally get to where I want to go. <laughs> my favorite creature. The rattlesnake. Mm. Now, what do we consider this guy to be? Mm. Mm. Ah, you guys are good. <laughs> so, this is a distinction I'm going to make. Which is to say, poisons and venoms have a lot in common. They're both toxins, they're both harmful, but they're used in different contexts, depending on whatever that creature is trying to do. If we consider something like a toad, mm. <laughs> These guys we consider to be poisonous because they excrete some sort of poison on the outside of their skin, maybe through these warts on their backs, so to speak, such that if you were to eat them, you would become sick or die. But if a toad bites you, nothing's going to happen to you, right? It's just kind of comical, really. <laughs> but then we have these individuals. Which have these nice, beautiful fangs that drip this copious amount of venom. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're looking at something that has a harmful bite. But, you can cook up and serve rattlesnake. <laughs> you can eat these guys. And so that's how we distinguish between mm -hmm. these two terms. Poisonous and venomous. But just to be confusing, there are some species of snakes that you would not want to make a snake sandwich out of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was my old master's advisor, by the way. He had this idea. That was pretty funny. But uh, this is my pet snake, and, and she did a very nice job of handling uh, a stressful situation. <laughs> but if we think about poisonous snakes in the world, there's only about four that we typically consider as being dangerous to eat. 
And three of these are found here in the U.S. along the West Coast. And they're just kinds of garter snakes, like what we see around here. Mm -hmm. And then there's another species <coughs> out in Southeast Asia, the type of keelback snake. Mm -hmm. But each of these cases, all four, are actually both poisonous and venomous, which is mm -hmm. even more confusing. Mm -hmm. But that's because these guys produce a venom in a venom gland, mm -hmm. including the garter snakes in this state, as we'll get to here in a second. But then on the back of the neck, they almost have like those glands of the toad in some of these species. They're able to store that poison and make themselves dangerous to eat. So they have two different toxins, two different locations, used for two different purposes. Exempting the confusing exceptions here, what we're going to focus on is more straightforward situations. Because these are unique situations that don't include Indiana. Right? We're here to talk about Indiana and the snakes here. As far as Indiana is concerned, we don't have any poisonous individuals. As far as we know so far. You can always discover more. But even aside from that, we have to now take our knowledge of venom and apply it on a very real kind of level. Because now we have to think, well, heck, if we have all these creatures that produce venoms, which are actually dangerous to us. Because now we have to put things in perspective that what's dangerous to this ant is not necessarily going to be dangerous to us. And the same thing applies to them. <coughs> and so if we think about the term venom, it's a very absolute kind of situation. Either you're venomous or you're not. <laughs> but danger is relative. And that's what we're here to try to convey. And so as we're looking at some of the different species in the world, and if we look at snakes in particular, we'll note that most of them are venomous. They produce some sort of venom. But only some are actually dangerous to us and can imperil our lives. And so we use a term to distinguish between these two categories by saying that the former are mildly venomous because they can't really harm us. And the latter are highly venomous, because they can. And we do the same thing with spiders, because all except for a couple species of spiders are venomous as well. And we do the same thing with them, because only a few species are dangerous to us. Only a few species are highly venomous. But part of the reason for this, once we actually start looking at the biochemistry of these venom compounds, it starts to make sense. Because some of these are highly specific towards one kind of prey. Right? Spiders really have venom that is typically tailored towards bugs, the other bugs that they eat. Not a lot of those compounds are very dangerous to us. They're so specific to their targets. But we see the same types of things in snakes. Maybe there are certain venom compounds that are really dangerous towards birds and lizards, but harmless towards mammals like us. But once again, we can break this down just a little bit further and make it a little <laughs> easier for us to track which species are which. Which are mildly venomous, which are highly venomous. And that's because venom is considered to be one of two systems. Either the typical way that we think about venomous snakes, where we have this nice individual uh, that has these large teeth here up in front that deliver the venom into the wound very, very quickly. We call these front fang snakes. These are going to be all of our rattlesnakes, all of our cobras, the sea snakes, coral snakes, all these fun snakes that we know as being dangerous. But the other types of snakes, the more subtle examples, like the garter snake that we had mentioned before, these guys instead have these very small little things near the back of the mouth. They're very, very hard for us to get bitten by. And they involve a venom system which is very different. It's a very slow flow kind of mechanism. They can't pump a lot of venom into you very quickly. They normally have to chew in order to get that venom into you. Mm -hmm. But if you compare just the sizes of these two fangs side by side, pretty remarkable difference. Mm -hmm. So that helps explain why these guys are typically mild, mildly venomous. And these guys are highly venomous, just because they're venomous. Uh, injection mechanisms are very, very different. 
But even aside from that, <coughs> even something that's rear-fanged and mildly venomous can still be dangerous to some degree. Because of the fact that there are a few things that we can get from these guys that aren't necessarily directly tied to their venom. Like we can get flu, for instance, or salmonella from handling them. And if they bite us, well, we can get tetanus. Which is why it's so important to keep up on your tetanus shots, right? When you're out gallivanting around and handling snakes. But then we also have some external parasites to consider. Things like ticks and mites. Maybe even some internal parasites like tapeworms. So we do have a few different ways we can consider snakes to be dangerous or not. And we always have to be mindful of all these things. But keep in mind, if we were to draw out a list of all the different things that you can get from cats, or dogs, or all the other fun creatures that we use as common pets, that list would far outrank this list by a factor of 10. Because they're mammals and birds. Mammals and birds are a lot more dangerous to us and transfer a lot more things to us that we can get sick by. So snakes are the least of your worries when it comes to this list. Not all people would agree with that. Okay, so now that we've set up the basics, let's go ahead and talk about the snakes here in Indiana, right? And in particular, I'm going to try to focus on snakes that you guys can go out and find, theoretically speaking, in Allen County. Now, before I get to that, I'm just going to quiz you again and ask you how many species of snakes you think we have here in Allen County. Mm. Anybody have a clue? Gander, yes. Three. Higher than three. Six. Higher than six. Twelve. Twelve is very close. So we're typically thinking about maybe somewhere around 14 for Allen County. Historically, anyway. Maybe not necessarily today, but historically 14. How about for the state? If we have 14 here for the whole state, what do you think? More than 20. More than 25. 35 is very close. 39. 39. Wow. Probably a lot more snakes than you thought were living here in this state. We actually have a decent diversity of species here. And because of that, we can go ahead and classify these guys based on what kind of snake they are. We can use some of these terms that we just went over. Most of the snakes in the state are rear fanged and produce a venom of some kind. But once again, they're harmless to us. But they're very interesting to look at in the lab. We'll talk more about that uh, later. But then we do have some truly non-venomous species that don't produce any venom. They're typically uh, constricting snakes. The rest of these really don't do that so much. Um, but we do have four that are highly venomous. And we'll take a look at those species here later on. But once again, we don't have any species that are poisonous. You can certainly eat any of these, should you choose, and not get sick. Now once again, thinking about Allen County in particular, we don't have many non-venomous, we only have two, and we only have one highly venomous, with the rest of them all being rear fed. And so we'll just briefly take a look at each one of these, because once again my goal is not to train you on snake identification so much. We're going to focus on the big guys and the important stuff. So, let's go ahead and race through these real quick. Uh, wow. See what I did there? Yeah, yeah. Kind yeah, yeah. of <laughs> funny. Uh, so, our first example we're looking at is one of my favorite lovely specimens that we have here in Indiana. Yeah. Definitely the fastest snakes that we have in the state, which is why we call them racers. Capable of going as fast as five miles an hour. Mm. But keep in mind, humans can go about 20 or so, so we can still outrun them. <laughs> However, through thick brush, these guys are looking. So that's why they're called racers. But very, very beautiful snakes here. And so with each one, I'm just going to briefly talk about it and move on so we can get through uh, to the important stuff here. Then, of course, we already talked about our garter snake. This particular individual is an eastern garter snake. But you'll notice I say something here. I point out the fact that we actually have four garter snake-like species here. 
And actually, in the whole state, we have about eight. Right? So there are lots of garter snakes that all have the same kind of pattern to where we have a stripe down the back and these two stripes down the sides. Now, normally, when people come across these, they don't feel it terribly necessary to be able to identify it two species. Right? Just saying broadly, it's a garter snake. And in, unfortunately, in some cases, they choose to go out of their way to kill these animals. Right? Well, there is a species, once again, historically at least, that's present in this county that you probably wouldn't want to kill. The butler's garter snake is an endangered species, which means that if you were bold enough to take pictures of your kill and post them, and somebody tattles to the DNR on you, you can be faced with thousands of dollars in fines and even jail time because you killed an endangered animal. So that's one of the reasons why I would strongly discourage killing snakes, even if they look like a garter snake, because we do have some endangered individuals that are protected within the state of India. But aside from that, we do have some other garter snake-like species. We have the ribbon snake here, which is a beautiful individual. They typically have these little white spots by their eyes. We have these queen snakes, which are also very garter snake-like, except now that they don't have that back stripe. Otherwise, very, very similar. But the queen snakes share something in common with this snake. The fact that these are really the two species that are most aquatic up here in this particular area. And so if you're near a body of water, even within a mile of it, you can find water snakes and queen snakes. Mm -hmm. Now what I'm showing you on this particular slide, I'm going to just spend a moment on this species, is what happens as the snake ages. So we start out with this color and pattern that mm -hmm. tends to be, yeah, dull, but still vibrant to some degree. But as the snake ages, what happens is, is he turns very, very dark <coughs> to where he's almost black. <coughs> Which leads some people to believe that they've come across a cottonmouth, which is also often very dark, almost black in color. But the truth of the matter is, is that cottonmouths are not up here. That's not the one snake that I said was highly venomous. They're only present in southern Indiana. So what you're seeing in the water is just a harmless northern water snake. Now these guys. <coughs> These guys probably aren't present in the county anymore just because there has been so much development. Uh, they tend to like old growth forests uh, and areas like that that we don't necessarily have around here too much. But they're very, very interesting, these eastern hognose snakes, just because they like to play dead. When you come across them and disturb them, they flip upside down, they stick their tongue out, you release a nasty odor, and convince you to go away. Very, very neat individuals, uh, should you ever come across one of them. But they have this very uh, hog-like nose that helps them kind of burrow underground. So that's, that's why they're named that. Now we have these little snakes. Some of these worm-like snakes. They're very, very small. Probably only about the thickness of a pencil in most cases. And when we come across them, they almost look like worms to some degree. Even with this individual here, which just barely has a stripe down the middle of the back. And so we call this guy the northern brown snake. But then some of these worm-like snakes, like this one here, the Kirtland snake, can be a little prettier. They can have some reds and some whites uh, amongst the black. But once again, the Kirtland snake is another kind of snake that's protected within the state of Indiana. And for some reason, this guy really does love certain urban areas. I receive calls about people uh, having these in their homes in downtown Indianapolis. Which is pretty remarkable. But once again, they're endangered. It's illegal to even touch them without permission from the DNR. The other two worm snakes that we're going to focus on as being here. The one is actually pretty common. The uh, ring neck snake here, just because he has this very orange-like collar around him. And if he flips upside down, he can display his vibrant yellow and orange and reddish kind of belly on it. Once again, in an effort to kind of warn you that he could be dangerous or that he is uh, somehow poisonous to eat. Once again, he's playing with you, right? trying to trick you. 
Another similar species here with the uh, red belly snake. Um, he also almost has a collar, uh, but he also has a, a dark sided underbelly. I'm just not showing it in this particular uh, example. But still, two very neat little worm like snakes here. But then we have our non venomous snakes. And with that, I said they were constrictors. And I'm going to start out with the big Bertha here, uh, our black rat snake, that gets to be the third largest or third longest snake in the entire United States. At about eight and a half feet long. Which is pretty remarkable. But these guys, as their name might suggest, love eating rodents. And they also love climbing trees. So if you see a large object in a tree climbing around, it's probably one of these. <clears throat> but the other kind of constrictor that we have is much smaller, maybe only half the size, and tends to live on the ground and hunts mice, most typically. But we'll talk about these guys here in a sec in another aspect. These eastern milk snakes are very important for one more comparison that I'm going to do here in a sec. But just for now, I want to mention one of his behaviors that's very peculiar that honestly was very intimidating and scary to me when I came across him for the first time when I was 15. Mm -hmm. Sorry, double checking with my best friend who was there at the time. <laughs> uh, so about 15 years old, I finally came across one of these guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was intimidating to me because he started making a sound like a rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. It made me question myself as to whether I had identified this guy correctly or not. Mm -hmm. And what turns out is that these snakes are great at mimicking the sound of a rattlesnake by quickly vibrating their tail against dry leaves. Once again, in an effort to show you that they're dangerous, potentially, and to ward you off as a predator. But we'll, we'll, uh, we'll come back to that behavior here in a second. What you guys want to know is the highly venomous specimen that can theoretically inhibit or inhabit the types of environments that we have right next door. The swamp rat, or the eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. Now, historically, this guy has been present in swamps all across northern Indiana. But once again, due to what we do to habitats, like drain them, and turn them into croplands, and into urban areas, they have been incredibly on the decline. So much so that they are also an endangered species. Mm. Not just at the state level, but they're a federal candidate mm. for being an endangered species. Which means that the fines are even higher for this particular individual. Mm. But if we think about these rattlesnakes, they're not giant like the rattlesnake <laughs> pictures I've been talking about before. These are very, very small species, only getting up to two feet. And when we look at these guys, they tend to be very kind of stout, unassuming little critters um, that don't often rattle when you come across them. They often hide amongst <coughs> the weeds in the swamp and hope that you'll see them. But if we notice something about the color and the pattern here, it looks very, very similar in many ways to that eastern milk snake. <coughs> And now it starts to make sense as to why the eastern milk snake rattles its tail. Because it's not just mimicking the behavior of this snake, but it's mimicking the pattern and the color as well. Once again, as a protective measure in a form of mimicry. So let's say that you come across some snakes and you need to have some additional information on what to do at that point, right? Because it's kind of good to know and be prepared for a time where you might come across something. And if there's one thing that I can't stress enough, never ever do what I do, <laughs> right? It's when people come in and do things like interact with animals that they can't identify, or they are wild animals, that we tend to have bad things happen. And honestly, in order to get to this point, it takes a lot of knowledge and a lot of training. Now granted, I've given some of those training seminars myself to a number of different officials here in the state of Indiana through the DNR. 
uh, all the state park naturalists, maybe some of the nuisance wild animal control officers as well, in order to try to get them prepared to deal with these species. But even with that, and all that knowledge and all that experience, there's still cases where even I can't identify a snake from farther than two feet away. <clears throat> Which brings us to a problem. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to come up to the snakes oh, and deal with them with extreme prejudice. Whether you can identify them or not. Because it's when you get up close and personal with snakes that bad things can happen. That's when you can get bit. And what we see is, statistically speaking, the vast majority of all snake bites are because somebody was doing this or doing this in the wrong situation. And so now we're to the point, well, maybe you did something, maybe you accidentally got bitten. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was my wife, I've been bitten a few times. <laughs> Actually, there was a time I was uh, posing for a picture very similar to this one, and then I got bit in the face, which was... Uh-huh. <laughs> yep, that was my fault. <laughs> but uh, let's talk about what you should do. If you were to be bitten, which is to say, just use common sense. Use typical first aid techniques. Right? So, clean the bite area. Go ahead and coat it with an antibiotic, cover it with a bandage, and get to a hospital. I call these the four C's that you should do. Now, once you're at the hospital, that's where the hospital is the one in, uh, responsible for determining whether you need antivenom or not. It's never mandatory because antivenom is a dangerous product and you can actually die from the antivenom itself. You can have an allergic reaction. We don't want that to happen, so we only give you antivenom if you absolutely positively need it. But four things you should not do are what I call the four S's. Don't shock the bite site. Take out your stun gun and zap it. That is a bad idea. It has never worked in the history of mankind. <laughs> Don't suck the venom out for the exact same reasons. Bad idea. Same thing with slicing open the wound. Bad idea. Don't do it. And especially, most of all, keep in mind that you're Brain is a very powerful tool, <clears throat> and that remaining optimistic is your greatest ally in this process. Mm. Don't think that you're going to die. It's going to erase your heart, mm. and if you do have venom in you, it's just going to make the situation worse. It's going to spread the venom more quickly, and you will die more quickly, <laughs> if you truly weren't venom. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just going to stress yourself out into uh, passing out uh, due to uh, hyperventilation. So don't do that either. Mm. But let's say, you're going to maybe a supermarket, or Dick's, or Gander Mountain or something, or Gander Outdoors, I guess it's called now, and you come across this particular device. This device is sitting on a shelf, and you're like, oh, well, this is called the Snake Bite Venom Extraction Kit. Well, that sounds great. I'm going to get that. And you open it up, and you find a number of suction devices, and a nice little scalpel, maybe some antibiotic, maybe some string, all designed to help you do all the things I just told you not to do. <laughs> it's encouraging you to slice open the wound and suck out the venom. This is all garbage nonsense. None of this actually works. Because venom does one thing very, very well. It disperses instantly in your tissue the moment it enters your body. You will never get that back out. So if you truly were envenomated, all are you going to do is hack and slash and perform your own tattooing at that point? It's <laughs> a bad, bad idea. Once again, another garbage product that's on the shelves, robbing you of money and preying upon your ignorance. People should be put, off, put out of business. But the other thing to keep in mind is that if you are bitten by a snake, once again, don't capture or kill it. It doesn't matter. None of it's going to matter. However, if you are given an opportunity to do so safely, certainly get out your phone and take a picture. That can, in some cases, help. But don't do this. 
when taking the picture. Right? This is a little close. Even though this is a frog, and this is my sister, and different situation. But still, don't do this. Don't put yourself in more danger by getting that picture. If you can't get the picture, that's okay. Don't worry about it. But at the end of the day, what it comes down to is if you want to get rid of a snake, just contact the professionals. Notify Wildlife Hotline, notify the DNR, or some other <coughs> removal service. I once had a removal service, the Hoosier Snake Hunters. Mm. It's now strictly an educational service. But these people are meant to do that. Okay? Mm. They have the training and the tools to do so. Mm. But, once again, if you're in a situation where you can do so safely, <coughs> you can go ahead and grab a broom and try to brush the snake out the door. If you're given the opportunity. Otherwise, uh, let the professionals deal with it. Because it's up to us, as humans on this planet, to be knowledgeable, responsible, and honestly, just to be good stewards of this planet. Mm -hmm. And to try to care for as much of the surrounding environment and wildlife as we can. Because at the end of the day, we are in control of these situations. We are ten times the size of any snake that we're going to come across. We can get away. That snake can't always. So, just some things to keep in mind. But let's say you're given a situation where the snake continues to come back. Well, that tells you that there's probably something that you have that the snake wants. As we look at this backyard here, this was a call I went out to. This lady was complaining of snakes in her backyard. Mm. As we look at it, there's not a whole lot there. Right? Mm. It actually looks relatively clean, mm. uh, except for this little area here right by the patio. That little area of clutter is all it takes. Mm. That provides adequate shelter, provides some food, maybe even access to mates. That's all that snakes need. Mm. And so they can continue coming back to your property so long as you continue having those, to those types of things available to them. And we have to remove the root cause of the situation if you want long-term success. But unfortunately, this is really the only advice I can give you. I hate to say that, because I wish I could do more. But unfortunately, when you're going to the store, <clears throat> there is nothing that you can do at the store that's going to help you. <coughs> None of the poisons or snake repellents that they offer at the store mm -hmm. are going to work for you. Once again, they're all garbage. Mm -hmm. None of them work. They have all been tested. And there are even times, namely in places out west, not so much here, but places out west where they're exposed to more dangerous animals on a regular basis, like rattlesnakes, to where they market this vaccine, vaccine for their pets. They get dog vaccine or cat vaccine or a horse vaccine. Vaccine for snake venom. That should protect your animal from being bitten by a rattlesnake. Those are also pure garbage. And have zero evidence supporting their efficacy. It sucks shopping. A lot of these marketers are trying to get your money based on no evidence of efficacy. And it works very effectively. <coughs> So we're finally to our last section here, where we're going to go ahead and discuss maybe some of the different types of snakes that you guys can identify, not only here in this state, but also elsewhere in the country. And so I'm going to go over some general rules that are going to be broadly applicable to help you along those lines. But with that, we have to go ahead and talk about the other three snakes in this state. We said that we had the Massasauga really present in all these blue and green counties in the upper part of the state. So those tend to have the swamps, at least historically speaking. Once again, this is not necessarily representing current ranges, but historically this is where they've been found. As we get to the lower portion of the state, that's where we find the other three species. Copperheads throughout all this, maybe some timbers in the red areas, and then maybe some cottonmouths down here uh, near the Ohio River. But once again, what's interesting about this map is look at central Indiana. 
Yeah. Those are your safe zones if you have a phobia. <laughs> 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 But that's interesting, because that tells us that Indiana isn't exactly a haven for some of these dangerous snakes. But one of the types of snakes we do have, a number of examples of, is the rattlesnake. And we know that's pretty straightforward. If you find a rattle, that's going to be highly dangerous. That's intuitive. That makes sense. This is very much different from that. But once again, you recall the example of the Eastern Milk Snake. You have to see the rattle. And even considering that, a number of snakes have had their tails targeted and removed by various mm -hmm. things. By prey, or, or through a predation event, by a predator. Mm -hmm. Or, maybe they came up to a lawnmower too close, right? Mm -hmm. Lost the end of their tail. Mm -hmm. So once again, that's still kind of a subjective thing. But it's pretty straightforward if you see it. Mm. Then we come to my favorite, which is the shape of the head. Mm. So I'm sure you guys have heard this, okay. that snakes with arrow-shaped heads are dangerous. <coughs> and certainly, if we look at the head of a rattlesnake mm. and compare it to an arrow, yeah, OK, I can see that. If we look at the head of a garter snake, mm. well, that seems more tubular, almost like a bullet would be. That makes sense to us. But then we have this individual. <laughs> We're like, oh, I, I don't know about that. Hmm. Kind of looks arrow shaped, just because the neck does seem kind of skinny here. The head seems pretty big and beefy at the back here. So I'd probably call that an arrow shape. This is the northern water snake. And in fact, this garter snake, this very one, can stretch its jaws outward mm. to look like this mm -hmm. in a defensive display. Try to look big and bad and intimidate you to go away. <clears throat> this method is highly subjective. It is not a good way to determine what's a dangerous species of snake or not. <clears throat> So we should never ever use this method. The portal egg. <laughs> if we look at snake eyes, we often hear, well, if it has a vertical pupil, it's dangerous. Because certainly there are snakes with round eyes, uh, maybe just normal or maybe with a cataract on it. And we can differentiate those from a vertical pupil, like a cat's eye, just fine. But then we have our last couple examples here that are kind of weird. There are species of snakes which have horizontal pupils. <clears throat> which you're like, I don't know what's going on there. That's, that's weird. It's like a horizontal cat eye. Uh, uh, frog. And then we have this example here, which is a rattlesnake. That's getting ready to shed. So he has this nice blue covering over his eyes. But if you'll note, it looks very, very round to me. <clears throat> that's because these vertical pupils can dilate. Mm. to where they appear to be round. Mm -hmm. So once again, eye shape is not necessarily the best technique that we can use here. <clears throat> so let's look at something a little more definitive, maybe. Maybe something like looking for some of these heat-sensing pits, which are a distinctive feature of rattlesnakes. <clears throat> but not just rattlesnakes, also the other two species that we have in this state, the copperheads and the cottonmouths. As we look at the side of these guys, we'll notice it's a large opening here, mm. right between the eye and this tiny nostril. Mm. And this large opening faces forward. You can actually mm. see the inside of the membrane as you look straight at these animals. Mm. And these are these heat sensing pits that give these guys the ability to see body heat in complete darkness. Mm. Which is why they face forward, which is why they're large instead of facing outward and being these very small little pinholes just for breathing through the nostrils. And if we compare them to any other non-venomous or rear fang venomous snake in the state, we don't see anything here. We just see the nostril and the eye. This is an effective technique. However, how close do you have to be? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say that tiny part of the Too close. 
So that's a little bit of a problem. That's still pretty good. Another thing that we can use as a technique is looking at the bottom of the tail. If we look at the bottom of the tail, in all of our non-venomous and rear fang species, all of this area from their cloaca, which is where they do their business, from their cloaca backwards, we have two scale rows, as opposed to things like rattlesnakes, which just have one. This is also an incredibly effective technique. But once again, yeah. I kind of have to pick up the snake and check its tail. No, it's it's probably not the best idea, right? <laughs> so probably a bit of an issue for us. So if we consider all these different methods I've gone over to identify dangerous snakes, no matter where you're at, most of them are garbage or subjective. Only two are effective. And to see those two, you have to be much closer than two feet. <laughs> So what are we to do? Well, there is one safe option. If you come across a snake skin, you actually can identify certain characteristics on that skin. <coughs> you can sit here, depending on how intact the skin is, you can identify the number of scales these guys have, which is a defining feature for most of these species in the state. You can even, as you look at this, almost see a bit of the pattern and color that this animal was which can also help us identify what he is. And you might even be able to see some of the other features that we just talked about, like those holes that are going to be where those heat-sensing pits were on the face. But that's about it. You can't necessarily tell if there's a rattle. You can't necessarily see the pupils. And you can't necessarily determine the head shape or even the size of this thing due to how the skin stretches. But a skin shed can certainly help. And so that comes to our final bit of points here, which is why do we want these snakes around? Why do we care? Why can't we just kill them all? Other than making me very sad. There are some ways that applies to your life. And it comes to managing a number of pest species. Right? Things that attack not only plants in our gardens, but also our crops. And can spread diseases to people. Things like our slugs and beetles and mice. <clears throat> snakes can manage all these species. They provide us with free pest control. Billions of dollars every year. For free. But it's gone beyond that in recent years. We've been able to take the venom from some of these animals and develop them into drugs. Things like Captopril, Vipernex, Xanta. Mm -hmm. And some of these drugs have been developed from the venoms of snakes in our own state. Mm -hmm. The pygmy rattlesnake is a close cousin to the Massasauga. The copperhead, we have here. We've already been using these drugs to save thousands of lives. Mm -hmm. People with high blood pressure problems, people with stroke, people with ischemia. Mm -hmm. But then we're asking still, at the end of the day, the question, what is the cost to human life? How many people are dying because of snakes? Well, let's go through it real quick. If we consider these four factors, just to put things in perspective, we're not referring to global events lately to where aircraft have had issues and resulted in a lot of deaths. We're talking about domestic flights, but we're going to compare those to snakes, lightning, and dogs. I'm just going to give you a couple seconds here to try to think up in your mind how you would rank these in order from responsible for most deaths in the U.S. to least deaths, just amongst these four. I think they're in order. Yes, they are. You think they're in order? Yeah. Two, eight, three. three. From most to least, left to right. Eight. You guys nope. are killing me up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really close. Yeah. Yeah. Really close. So I list snakes as being the least of your concerns here. So let's take a look at the numbers. Here's snakes. 
<clears throat> They're responsible for an average of six deaths every year in the United States. Mm. Just six. Mm -hmm. You compare that to something that people tend to be much more friendly to, like the dog. <laughs> but you're responsible for almost six times more deaths. Mm. And you compare it to something, just to any other thing on this list above that, and mm. all of these are the least of your concerns. Mm. Even though people are far more likely to be killed in a vehicle than on a plane, people are terrified of planes right now. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these causes are nothing, mm. especially when we consider snakes in reference to the rest of them. Mm. And so just to finish up this presentation, I want to go through some other myths about snakes. <laughs> like when you look at a mother snake laying next to her baby, which barely takes up the same amount of space as her head. <laughs> and we hear this rumor, this idea, that that baby is somehow more dangerous to us than the mother is. Because its venom is more toxic. And although that is true, drop for drop, we have to consider this is her venom gland. This giant thing right here mm. is her venom gland. This baby's venom gland is this right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That baby only produces maybe up to 5% of what that adult can inject into you. Mm -hmm. That adult is far more dangerous than that baby. And so, regardless of your ideas of whether that snake can control its output from birth, it can. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Even if injected all of it into you, you're going to die a lot faster from that adult than from the baby. <clears throat> but then we hear some other things. Like maybe that venom itself is somehow evolving to be more deadly. Mm. Evolution does occur. It's true. But that rate of evolution is going to be different than what we normally think of. Normally it operates on the level of thousands of years, not within our lifetimes. So it's not a concern. As you're going through maybe social media or news sites, mm -hmm. you might sometimes see an image like this. My lovely wife holding the snake for me and managing not to get bit at the same time. <laughs> but where we see these forced perspective pictures and make it seem like these animals are really close to the camera and giant compared to what's in the background. And you might see some sort of caption like, oh, this is a six foot long water moccasin that's four inches wide with two inch long fangs. <laughs> it can kill you just by looking at you. <laughs> okay. And so let's analyze each one of those statements. Right? Even if we just look at the size of my wife's thumb, which is just a little bit, a little bit smaller than the width of this animal, her thumb is not three inches wide. I will tell you that right now. <laughs> so, four inches wide is garbage. Then, if we look closely at this animal, this picture is actually good enough to where you can see the pupils very clearly, if you're really up close. These are round pupils, hmm. not vertical pupils. This is a northern water snake. Hmm. Therefore, not a water moccasin. Hmm. And because we know it's a northern water snake, we know <coughs> that they only get to be four and a half feet long. Hmm. Not six feet long. Hmm. So, when we look at things online, once again, they're often complete garbage, meant to trick you, to lie to you, and to have fun. But then you'll sometimes see things like this. <laughs> this is my wonderful niece, sound asleep because she doesn't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so it was okay with my sister, so I got parental approval. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't advise doing this. This was under controlled conditions. And what we see here is we see this five foot long animal, this ball python, curling up next to the sleeping child. And we sometimes hear this idea that this snake is sizing up its next victim, planning to eat that child in her sleep. Let's take a look at that. It's true, this snake is five feet long, which is longer than this child is tall. I think she was about three and a half feet at the time. That's true. 
But when it comes to snakes, they can only consume things that weigh as much as they do. This snake was seven pounds. This child was 40. It's a bit of a mathematical problem <laughs> putting those two together. She would never consume this child. She's there to get the warmth from her body. That's it. <clears throat> And if we just consider it from a natural perspective, snakes don't go out in the wild, walk up to a prey item, like a mouse, and say, hey, you just sit there for a second. And then stretch out real quick. Okay, I can eat you. Yeah. That doesn't happen. So if any of this interested you at all, you can certainly look up more information online. You probably even come across a couple of my articles. Uh, just by typing in something like, how to identify snakes in Indiana. I've created the Wikipedia page on the list of snakes for Indiana. Mm. And I've created a very nice web page that goes into great detail mm. to allow you to identify snakes down to the species. Mm. Even aside from that, if you just want general information about snakes, you can also Google facts about snakes. Mm. Uh, FAQS. I have some very nice articles on there as well. Mm. So with that, just kind of wrapping up this, con this conversation here. This presentation I want you to just go home with a better understanding of snakes mm -hmm. so you don't just go out and kill them randomly and so we can at least gain the appreciation for these wonderful animals do a lot of things for us and they're honestly more of a benefit to us and the planet that we often give them credit for mm -hmm. but now that you've learned so much about snakes mm -hmm. if you haven't already I do have an individual up here that you can come here and gander at. So, this particular individual is a baby form of the snake that was lying down next to my niece. This is a ball python. And once again, these guys only get to be five feet long. She's only, uh, she's less than a year old at the moment. But, when we think about some nice things about these snakes. One, is that they're typically very docile. And two, is that they don't get to be very long, but they live a long time. Mm. So the fact that she can be about five feet and live to be about 40 years old is great for someone like me. <coughs> Maybe not for all pet owners. Mm. But when it comes to this animal, if you wanted to come up here and take a look at her, you can appreciate why we named her what we did. Mm. And so what I've done is I've kind of presented this picture of the side and underbelly uh, of this particular creature to help you, help you understand why we named her what we did. We named her Jua. We named her Jua because <coughs> these snakes, these ball pythons, are native to West Africa. And as we look at her side, we almost see this transition from kind of a white to maybe a yellow, almost this orangish and brownish kind of color up here. When I looked at that, I couldn't help but think of a sunrise. And so my wife, being the, the clever genius that she is, she looked up a Swahili term for sunrise, which was jua. And jua has a number of interesting characteristics that are very much like some of these characteristics that we just talked about. She has an arrow-shaped head when you look at it. She has some heat-sensing organs in the front of the face. These are a little different than rattlesnakes, but there's still a little indentation, so to speak, in the skin that face forward. And she also has some other interesting things. If we look at the bottom of her tail on either side of the cloaca, she has these almost spur-looking things, which are actually the remnants of legs, little femurs. They're actually attached to a pelvis. Because snakes used to, be uh, used to be reptiles, used to be lizards in particular. They just lost those legs through the process of evolution. These guys still have a little bit of remnants from them. <laughs> and now we're finally to the end where you guys get to talk to me more than I talk to you. So, if you have any questions. Uh, two, two quick ones. Uh, yeah. Number one, do you, the slide you had with the causes of death from most to least, that, that you made that slide up custom, or is that out on the internet anywhere? Uh, yeah. Uh, All right, so this is something that I put together myself, you did. assembling the data from uh, various governmental agencies. Is that, is that um, in any of your articles? 
this is something I developed after I wrote my article. Okay. So I do need to add it to them. You are absolutely right. Okay. That's um, a good point. The second question is, uh, what would the, the other slide you had with the uh, population density of different varieties, with so many in the north and the middle of the state being uh, more free of snakes, what would you attribute that to? In fact, the central proximity Indiana. to water or central Indiana is boring. There is water. At least you're honest. <laughs> I blame it on glaciers. That's why I also blame it. The environment. Is is climate change, global warming having do having any effect on the distribution of snakes, for example? In and what, what would you predict in the future as warming continues? It's a very good question. Mm -hmm. um, as far as global warming is concerned, Indiana is in a part of the U.S. I normally show a graphic for my students every semester that shows how every part of the U.S. is changing mm -hmm. over the past couple decades. Because once again, when we think about global warming, we try to think of it in terms of global climate change because it changes climates a little differently. Even though most of the U.S. is warming, there's certainly parts of the U.S. that are cool. That's why we call it climate change. But the overall effect is the entire planet is warming. So. But anyway, the point is, is that Indiana is part of the warming sector. So, as we look at these distributions, theoretically, we could see an expansion of certain species that are common. Copperhead, all of this yellow, uh, even the green. Copperhead is a common species, relatively speaking. Copperhead, absolutely, we could see expand. Hmm. Expand north. Hmm. The rest of the species are all endangered. Their populations are never going to expand. Hmm. They will go down and whittle down until they become extinct. Hmm. Especially at the rate that we often see DNR regulating those species. Hmm. Which is to say, they don't allow people like me to do anything with them. They would rather them go extinct. Huh? Does that mean they don't have a means of migrating? Most of the time with these species, they're so limited in distribution, they're not being removed from their current position. They will stay there until they go extinct. Hmm. Now, with these individuals up here, the poor Massasauga that's heavily endangered, the whole warming is really going to impact them because they overwinter in crayfish burrows below the freeze line. Hmm. They will undoubtedly go extinct if we don't do better management of those species. Hmm. So the crayfish go, they go too. Hmm. Do, do they emit a, a smell? Because I think we were taught when we lived in southern Ohio that if you smell cucumbers, there's a snake sound that you feel before you're walking around. So, most all the species that I've talked about here emit a musk. I don't know of any species of snake that does not. Hmm. Absolutely. Water pollution, does, does it have a serious impact? Population. Most of the snakes on this graphic um, are either in areas where water pollution isn't necessarily the biggest factor or are so limited um, in distribution is also not a factor. Mm -hmm. The only time that would really be a factor is with these guys, but cottonmouths are common in other parts of the country, so we kind of don't care about them here in Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> Could you touch back again on, the, on that chart on the medical issues? This one? Yeah. So basically all I was doing was just presenting, um, th this list has expanded, I haven't updated this list um, in a couple of years, um, but undoubtedly it has expanded as far as the different types of drugs, the types of things that they're treating and the different snakes that we're using uh, mm. as a source of the venom for these different things. So we're basically saying that we've taken compounds from the venom and use them in these contexts. Mm. Is that the drug companies? No. So these are the drug names themselves. Yeah, but the companies are, are buying them for that purpose? So when we consider the source for novel pharmaceutical ideas and drug types, for new types of drugs, we're finding that it's actually closer to about two-thirds or 75% of the sources for those are all from, I hate to use this word, natural sources. <laughs> <laughs> 
So that includes plants and animals. Um, what are the family dynamics of, of snakes? Do the mothers protect the young? Are you needing to be more cautious if there's a young, if there are young snakes around? So, that's a great question. Um, the reason why I'm laughing is because my sister is the family person, I am not. So, just to uh, go back to our map of snakes here, there are certain species that don't necessarily do the best job of parenting, <laughs> which is why I don't have kids. <laughs> but when we consider these individuals that I've listed here, for some reason the vipers, which are the uh, cotton mouth, or the copperheads and the cotton mouths, and the rattlesnakes, those two seem to do a lot better than the other species of snakes mm -hmm. at parenting. Mm -hmm. Which is to say, they tend to protect their babies to at least one, maybe sometimes two or three times that they shed, um, mm -hmm. and protect them at the den site. Mm -hmm. So there's some parental care in the more advanced things. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, you, if you do get bitten by a snake, and you said the hospitals don't give the anti-venom unless absolutely necessary, how do they decide that if you don't know the snake, and how long would they wait? I mean, if you to each case their own. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't necessarily say that because that's going to be dependent on your symptoms and the doctor, where you were bit, um, and how much how much time it's uh, transpired since then. Touching on her question a little bit, since you've openly admitted to being bitten a few times. There's one instance, I recall, where you were actually bitten by a venomous snake, and she uh, asked about symptoms. Maybe you could elaborate on common symptoms on what it's like to actually be envenomated and follow the... <laughs> <laughs> and not follow the three C, four Cs that you follow. But, you know, in all honesty, it might give people an idea of what to expect if they are bitten by something that maybe might not be highly venomous, but could potentially be dangerous and help them not freak out. So much. Okay, so there was this one time when I was getting my masters and I was taking care of the snakes. And there was a species of snake that did uh, one of the things I mentioned on one of my slides um, that had venom compounds that were highly specific towards birds and lizards, hmm. but was ineffective against mammals. That happens to be my favorite species of snake in the world, brown tree snake, which has invaded Guam and wiped out most of the native wildlife on that island. Have you ever heard of that? Anyway, wonderful snake, absolutely ungodly in a number of ways. But it does have a component in the venom that does work against people, such that on Guam, if these snakes get into a crib and bite a child, mm. it can't stop the child from breathing. Mm. So it does have certain, quote, neurotoxic components that are capable of doing that. Mm. I knew that to a full-grown adult, their venom would not be very effective. But I got bit right before going to class one time. And so I started to log my symptoms as I'm sitting there in class, uh, experiencing it. <laughs> Basically, all that happened was there is a bit of numbness on the, type, on the tip of my finger that spread up through my arm uh, and started affecting my ability to swallow. That was all it did. Those symptoms went away after an hour. Uh, the, the tip of my finger was numb for a day. That was all that happened to me. So, with these symptoms, they do progress over a certain period of time as they spread throughout your blood system and your lymphatics. Um, to your core, where they t uh, typically are much more dangerous. So that's why we sometimes suggest doing some sort of loose ligature to limit your lymphatic return uh, to the rest of your body, because typically with these snakes, they go through the lymph system, not the circulatory system. Um, but once again, we run into issues with that if there's so much swelling that ligature tightens and completely cuts off blood flow. Mm. That's why I didn't include that in my list, because that's a bit more of a sketch situation requiring uh, direct medical professionals and attention. Mm -hmm. The swelling is typically something that accommodates most envenomations from these snakes in particular. This is in Indiana, but um, can you tell me if it's a copperhead, a coral snake, or maybe both that would be in um, like, uh, like around Philadelphia uh, or uh, Pittsburgh? So coral snakes really tend to be further south. Um, once we get into the furthest in the southeast, um, basically all the states that line the coast um, are going to have coral snakes. They don't reach too far uh, north and interior to that. So I don't believe we would have any possible chance of having coral snakes in, in uh, Pennsylvania. Probably. Copperheads, absolutely. But we can have king snakes 
that might have coloration similar to a coral snake. But is the king snake a poison snake? So the king snake is a, a type of non-venomous constrictor. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's going to be harmless. Okay. All right. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. So uh, it is almost 10 o'clock, and I know some of you have other places to go. Um, you're welcome to keep asking questions, but if you do need to, to go ahead and go, don't, don't feel like you're being rude, go ahead and go. And then if you don't forget to stop up here and see the snake. Yes. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you.